Okay, good morning again, everybody, and welcome again to our uh, second webinar in uh, plant sciences here at the Faculty of Agriculture in Israel. Uh, our first lecture today will be a guest lecture, the Pierce Alumni Guest Lecture by Lydia uh, Kansa from Ghana, right, Lydia? Lydia graduated from this program. She actually gave her seminar on a research exercise here in this room six years ago. Then she continued through a, a thesis stream, finished her master's, and now she's about to complete her PhD at Ben Gurion University. Lydia will be uh, lecturing us today on promoting underutilized endogenous species in, home gar in, in homegrown gardens as a tool to combat malnutrition in developing countries. Ghana as a case study. Lydia, please, we are very pleased to have you with us. Thank you. I want to thank Professor Saranga and then the committee for selecting me. Actually, I wasn't the person. The person couldn't come. So, and what I'm going to give is uh, actually something that me and like most of the Ghanaians who have been through this program is something that we are planning to do when we all get back home because everybody's around doing stuff. Um, most of us that came here, we all school in the northern part of Ghana. And it's a place which is really um, malnutrition. It's a, it's a big problem there in the northern part of Ghana. So we've been thinking we don't want our studies here. We've been here. We've gained a lot of knowledge. We don't want it to go wasted. So we've been asking ourselves, what can we do? And we all come from different places in Ghana. So we decided that, OK, so even if we cannot give back to our individual communities, we can give it to back to where we started and we got our first degree. So it's a program that. It's really something, it's something that is ongoing. There is not a lot of data. So most of what I'm going to give here, it was really like personal communication with people. And um, it's a small scale, and then we want to start it into a big scale. And then we'll know maybe in five years or 10 years, probably we'll be back here giving a lecture and then see the success of it. So yeah, so I completed the, the program six years ago, continue as Professor said, and I'm about finishing my PhD. So um, as a form of introduction, so what is malnutrition? Malnutrition is a, it's a very big uh, public health concern in developing countries, especially in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And later on, I'll show a graph, and you see how much it's really prevalent in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, it's, a, it's really a big problem among children from like after probably breast um, winning of bre when they, they are weaned from breastfeeding, so about around six months, one year up to five years, and um, and it's it's a really a big problem. It affects children uh, of school going age, and they become stunted, they become uh, very ill, and it also makes them more susceptible to other diseases like malaria, which is also very uh, prevalent in Africa. So this is a map that uh, um, um, the UN gave in 2000, from 2000 to 2003 about the different causes of death in children under five years of age. And you could see that you could see that the majority, about 50 percent of death that occurs in children under five years is caused by malnutrition, which means that it's a very big issue in, in children under five years of age. And malnutrition leads to high um, incidence of morbidity. And also, it's because the kids don't have all the, their immune system is very low. So then when they have other, like, uh, like wounding, it's, uh, it decreases the, the, the chances of getting a higher um, healing, um, he, a wound healing. And then it also increases infectious disease, like I mentioned before. And then there is high complication, and then con uh, convalency is very low. It increases mortality in kids, as I stated before. We saw them out before. And then treatment is very high. And in most cases, it's in the rural areas. And 
people don't really have money to treat their kids though so then it can lead to high incidence of death in these children and then length of stay in the hospital can be very high and even with this sometimes they don't even have access to good health in the rural uh, villages and then the cost of treating it is very high and then this leads to very low quality of life in these children so this was what i was talking about you can see the it's very prevalent in the sub-Saharan Africa and also in Asia, but then we can see that Africa is a very major part. When you compare Ghana, which is here, to other African countries, basically we are in the very 1% um, uh, malnutrition, but it's still a problem because we want a case that, like, it, it will be almost zero. And it's still a big problem and it's very challenging. So what has been, what is there in Ghana, I'm, I'm using Ghana as a study. So in Ghana, what has been found is that in most rural areas, bulk of our diet in Ghana is made up of uh, starchy food. We have cassava, we have yam, and then we have maize. We prepare a different dishes from it. It's then the kids can get it with like either soup or vegetables. But then the problem that they realize is that like we've been so much influenced by um, uh, vegetables, uh, exotic, uh, exotic veg uh, vegetable. Therefore, most indigenous crops are going extinct. And then these um, indigenous uh, vegetables are quite expensive. So these people cannot grow it, they cannot afford it. So mostly kids are getting food prepared and then it's only the starchy food they are getting. They are not getting anything. So then they are lacking in protein, they are lacking in uh, micronutrients. And then which leads to, uh, they become very malnourished and then it can lead to death. So, <coughs> The constituent of uh, malnutrition that has been put in by the UN, UN is uh, protein energy malnutrition, which, which is as a result from eating very high starchy food. And then the micronutrient deficiency because they don't get the <coughs> vitamins and um, micronutrient that they can get from vegetables and other um, crops. So what has been the intervention that has been put in across so far? So mostly children between, kids between zero to six months, it's mostly breastfeeding and then they don't need additional food. So it works up to from zero to six months, but then from six months going, they need to be supplemented. They need to be supplemented. Then that's where the problem comes. So they are supplemented mostly based on what I said before, like more starchy food and then they lack in basic um, um, uh, micronutrients and vitamins and then they are malnourished so apart from this what was the government doing so they started uh, supplementing food as in uh, biofortification so it was mostly given to the hospitals and then when parents take their kids to antenatal they are uh, uh, like they are distributed but this was this has not been effective because for this in Ghana I spoke with some of my friends who are in the nutrition sector they said like in Ghana, there are a lot of villages, like very remote villages, and then the clinics are in the district. So they have to walk a very long distance because there is poor roads, there is no accessibility to roads and stuff. And mostly the parents, they don't want, they don't go. So then they don't go to the clinic and then they don't have access to the food that is biosafe. So then the kids are still suffering from, you know, they don't get all the basic uh, nutrients that they need. So, so in this, then, the measures that is being put in place to ensure that even if parents don't visit, they can still give their kids uh, the needed nutrient that they need to grow and grow well is to um, food production through home, homegrown garden, which can ensure food security for these children also for their family. And then the main thing for my talk is the incorporation of indigenous crops, which they started doing a lot of uh, work on it to see what kind of uh, micronutrients most of these indigenous crops contain and then if it will really help in when they add it to the bulk of the stable diet that we have, like which comes from maize and cassava and, and yam, if it will help the kids in getting all the needed nutrients that they need. So homegrown gardens, what, um, it's, it, it's not a new thing. In the developing countries, it's been it's been it's uh, it's something that it was it used to be. It's still ongoing, especially I read the paper in uh, uh, is that either Pakistan or Sri Lanka. I can't remember, but then it's it's been very effective and proven to be effective to also be using to curb malnutrition. 
and then they, they've seen that it's a, it, in Ghana, it's a very uh, integral part of local food system and then the agricultural landscape. But then it was abolished because when um, f um, families started to grow to sell, so mostly it's kind of, they had huge farms which was very far away from home. They have to walk very long distances. So they didn't really care about growing, um, starting a small farm at home to kind of be a supplementary for the family when like they cannot go to the farm which is a very long uh, walk so it's also have it has been seen that it's a very home gardens are a, a time-tested local strategy that are widely adopted and practiced in various circumstances by local communities with limited resources and institutional support because mostly it's a, at, a, at a very small rate they can really control the weeds and they don't really need government support as like in um subsidized fertilizers, subsidized chemicals, or um, all those kind of stuff for a big farm. So what are the characteristics traits of homegrown garden? It's mostly located near the, near the <coughs> residence. It contains high diversity of plants, which when it's uh, incorporated with um, the indigenous crop, which is going extinct, then there is a, the, the food system is more diverse, and then they can have the main staple food and also they can get more um, minerals from the vegetables. And also production may be supplementary, as I said before, and then it occupies small spaces, which makes it more uh, accessible for the family to work on it because then they don't need to hire a labor. And also production system, uh, that is the poor can easily enter into it because they do not need any help from the government. So this, was, this is a picture of a homegrown garden in Kenya where you know the kid can water the the plant it's a lot of uh, leafy vegetables before they go to school and also then it's not a child uh, labor intensive so these are some of the indigenous crops in ghana that is being promoted to be used in homegrown gardens so this can, this is in the family of eggplant and it, uh, it's a local species that is uh, endemic in west africa you can find it in nigeria in benin in togo other West African countries. And it's, it has, I think, about 20, 29 to 30 species. And, but then I took only two because these are the main two that is being worked and then they are looking at the, the nutritional components out of it. And apart from this also, they are also um, encouraging the use of leafy vegetables. And this, veg this uh, leafy vegetable also actually, it's a root crop. It has, uh, it comes, like they can use the leaves and also it has a, a root tuber which is called cocoa So then when they grow this, they can use the leaf in preparing stew or soup for the kids. At the same time, they get the, the root tuber which can also serve as a main diet. So then it's kind of, they grow one thing and then they can even get more things from the kids eating. And this is also a highly um, nutritious vegetable that is mostly uh, grown in the northern part of Ghana where basically we are trying to start the project. So what are the nutritional values that has been seen in most of these vegetables that I show? So they've seen that it has very high moisture content that ranges from 70 to 90%. And then crude, a very, uh, also high crude fiber that ranges from one to 10%. Fat content between one to 3%. And carbohydrate, which is also between one to 13%. <coughs> And food energy is between 39 to 90 kilocalories per, per 100 gram serving. And then protein, which mostly is lacking in the main diet, the stable diet, which is mostly made up of uh, starchy uh, root crops. It's also, they've seen that it contains between four, four to six uh, percent of protein in 100, uh, kilo, uh, 100 gram servings, noted. And then iron, which is really important, and then we can see it's also in uh, Asia where they are, the golden rice where it's been fortified with a, a gene which can produce high amount of iron. So then if we have a local indigenous vegetab uh, vegetables that can produce iron, then the kids can get all the micronutrients that they needed. And then this can really help in carbon malnutrition. And phosphorus is a micronutrient which is also very important. So when, if we have local indigenous crop which contain these three important um, nutrient, then it is in a way going to help in, in um, helping to reduce malnutrition in children under five years. 
So what is the key benefit that they've seen in home gardening? So it's improved food security. That is, it increases availability of food and better nutrition through food diversity because there is more diverse kind of food that they can have more uh, robust form of selecting it. It decreases risk through diversification because mostly it's monocropping. So then if you plant only one crop and then there is drought or something, then the family is going to suffer. But then if you have other crops that you have more option of selecting, so then even if one crop fails, you still can rely on another crop. And also the surplus of it, it can uh, generate income for the family. And also it's, it's uh, environmentally friendly because it's in a small scale. Mostly there is the reduction of uh, using herbicides as we saw from, um, from Professor um, Baug's uh, lecture yesterday. Herbicide is a very big problem in, in the world because there is uh, misuse and overuse of uh, pesticides. So just in the home, they don't really need to use so much pesticide. And also they can use uh, recycled water, like water they use in their kitchen and stuff. They can use it to water so they, don't, they do not really need to use a uh, very um, high quality water, also not really low quality, but at least after washing their bowls, they can use the water to, to water the plant. And so then it becomes uh, very uh, environmentally friendly. So what is the success so far in Ghana? Home gardening has, uh, uh, has proven to provide easy day to easy day to day access to an assortment of fresh, nutritious and higher diverse foods. And also, it's uh, helping in obtaining more than 50% of the household needed vegetables, fruit, tubers, and yams from their garden. And it reduces the cost of going to buy food from outside. So in addition to the adding to the caloric uh, quantity, home gardens supplement stable-based diet with a significant portion of proteins, vit vitamins, and minerals, as I said, from the indig indigenous crop that is being incorporated into the main um, diet. And this is leading to an enriched and balanced diet, particularly for growing children and mothers, and especially in children who are more susceptible to uh, malnutrition. So what is the improvement? We know that mostly, uh, yes, we can get protein from plant-based diet, but then mostly we can, it's animal um, diet that we get it from. So in, if a homegrown garden is integrated with livestock and poultry, then it can reinforce food and nutritional security for the farmers, as milk, eggs, and meat from home-raised animals will provide the main, and in many instances, the only cheap source of animal protein, because if they need to buy the animal protein from outside, it's really expensive, and they do not have the, the resources to get that. And kids, they need all this uh, protein, especially for growing up and then building all their immune system for future um, curbing of other sicknesses like malaria, which is very prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. So in summary, home garden can be an essential tool to help uh, improve food security among rural population and has the ability to help reduce and curb malnutrition in children. And also it's viewed as a robust food system in circumstances where population pressures and numerous resources limitation persist, especially you don't need so much resources from the far, uh, from governments like, you know, as I said, uh, subsidized fertilizers or chemicals. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Questions, please. I have a question. I see on your last picture you just shown some of the story. You didn't talk about it in terms of promotion. I think it is better in terms of it's better compared to this. Sorry, sorry, I didn't I get see it. On your last picture, on your thank you slide, there is a multi story garden. Mm -hmm. I thought it's better compared to this from garden in terms of labor, in terms of production, in terms Why? of water usage. Why? Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, it's uh, you can try different stuff and see which one is more labor. Um, like it's not so much labor intensive. 
it doesn't require so much water so yes we are going to try and also as i it's ongoing it's not a new thing that it's uh, like we are going to start and people use different stuff when um when you go to the northern part of Ghana, some people use this sack, like uh, different things. So yes, it's not only like what I showed in Kenya. No, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm giving an option. I'm not asking a question. I'm saying maybe you can also try my story instead of yeah. OK. Thank you. Yes, Kumar. Uh, you mentioned at the time of malnutrition, uh, you focus on protein in energy malnutrition. Mm -hmm. Especially when you talk about malnutrition, the focus on protein energy. And you also saw your uh, most of the focus on protein sources and mineral sources. But I want to ask the reality in the ground is most of the almost a place there is energy nutrition, an energy malnutrition. That means lack of carbohydrate source of food. So what situation in your case? Well, that's what I'm saying. That in Ghana mostly it's the micronutrient. We don't have problem with energy because mostly we uh, most of the uh, food is highly. In carbohydrates so we don't have the problem but then we have the problem so it may be in asia but i don't know that's why i took ghana as a case study uh, it means uh, the source of carbohydrates in, uh, in okay, maybe i don't want to speculate because i don't know but then uh, that's why i'm using ghana as a case study because i'm very confident of that and i know what we have there so maybe yeah. in asia yes that's what is there but then in ghana we don't have problem with the uh, energy malnutrition mostly it's micronutrient deficiency your story is all about the rural area, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to relate it to, uh, to trying to relate it to the to the city, for example, because in Nigeria this home home garden we are talking about was actually uh, the, the president of our country um, some time ago tried to encourage us to have home gardens behind the houses, but people failed to do this for several reasons. One, maybe because of the stress involved in it. And it's a dirty job, of course. I'm not so sure. It's you cannot use to, um, to want to pull something off the ground. I mean, they're not using equipment or machinery. And um, so how would you encourage someone um, in, living in the city, in Lagos State, for example, mm -hmm. to go into a home garden? Look, it's not only in Nigeria. For instance, in Ghana, my, I, a lot of my friends who are not in the agriculture sector, they, they ask me, why will you do a PhD in agriculture? What are you going to do with it? Because they think agriculture is basically you know, relegated to the rural folks. They are supposed to do agriculture. So then if you tell someone in the city that, oh, you can do home garden, they say, I'm working, I get money, I can go and buy food. Yeah, but then they don't know that it can be supplemental. So for the cities, we are not focusing there because they have money to get all the nutrients they want. And that's why we are focusing in the rural areas where there is the tendency of the uh, lack of not getting everything that the kids need. Because the kids are going to be the future. And if they keep, and we, in Ghana, we have a very high mortality of uh, um, children death. And we want to prevent that. I mean, we cannot prevent it, but at least reduce it. So we are not focusing in the city, but then Maybe when people start to know that people start in the rural areas, people, people are having uh, excess food and stuff, maybe they, they can start. There is a, 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 a huge movement in the United States where they are saying that clear your grass and grow food or something, right? Yeah, you can. So maybe to start, people will know that agriculture is not only for the poor, in quotes. So who knows? It will come. It takes time. You know, in many countries, people in towns, they, they do it like a hobby. In certain towns, there are like, at the edge of the town, some plots divided into smaller plots. Each plot, each a per person can hire such a small plot and go there during the weekend just for the fun to, en to enjoy the, some open space, open air. And at the same time, grow his own fruit, vegetables, and enjoy uh, fresh produce grown by his own uh, hands. And, and I think for many people, depends whom, but the people that does have this kind of desire to do such thing, it's, it's, a, it's a great fun and it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice also for people in towns, I think. Yeah, yeah. And um, you just said something. And so one thing that I, I forgot, I needed to say it in the beginning. So this project that we are doing, it's not only those of us who did plant science, it's actually 
there has been Ghanaians who have done nutrition and plant science. So it's, I think, uh, three nutritionists and seven agri um, plant science students. So we are all combining. So it will be great, like, if you come and the plant science student, nutrition student, start combining. Don't just let your studies here just be, you know, for, you know, for yourself. But ask yourself what you can do for your community. And we'll tell stories in 10, 20 years to come. That's what we all hope. Because most of us come from developing countries. We have countries. an appointment. Mm -hmm. Yes. In 20 years. Yes, we do. All right. <laughs> yes. No, this was not the end of it. <laughs> I did not think. Yes, Gabriel. There is something that I don't understand here in your project, and it's especially on the what is exactly what you uh, what you do. You you encourage you encourage people to start this uh, small farms, uh, or you provide them with knowledge of how to uh, manage that, uh, manage them, or you provide them with the <coughs> materials with what to work. Okay, so we are not, we are just encouraging them, if you saw the topic, it's promoting indigenous crop. Yeah. Because as I said, we have so much indigenous crop in Africa. In Nigeria, there is about 129 species that is underutilized. So, and then they, they've, uh, they, they've done a lot of uh, nutritional profiling and they see that it has all the micronutrient that is needed for kids to grow. But then people have stopped growing this because now we have the carrot, the cabbage and stuff that comes from, you know, the, the Western world. But then it, the seeds are expensive because we don't have the, the climate that you can grow it and then you get a seed. So each time you have to buy the seed, but they cannot buy it. So then basically it's kind of they're only growing the root crops, which I showed, like the the yam, the cassava, and also maize. So then they do not have vegetables. So kids get food, but then they don't have the vegetables. So then what we are going to encourage, and which is, I, say, I told you this already, trying to encourage people to grow more of the indi indi uh, indigenous and the utilized crops. The seeds are there. You can go to the plant uh, genetic center in, in Ghana. It's in uh, Eastern region. And you can get the seeds for free. But farmers just don't want to do it because and there is this notion that if people see you eating the indigenous uh, vegetable, it's kind of you are poor or something. So it's just encouraging them to tell you that it's not, it, it doesn't mean that you are poor. It's just to think about your kids. So they kind of incorporate these underutilized crops into the main things they grow, like the yam, the maize, and thing, just to have a diversity. And also, so you have the main stable, and then you can have the vegetables also for the kids. And then they get all the nutrients that they need to grow, and then to boost their immune system against malaria, cholera, and other kind of diseases. So this is the main thing. So it's just to encourage them to grow more of the indigenous underutilized crops. And uh, don't you think that uh, this is a, this kind of plants, uh, this, yeah, this kind of plants that they are uh, um, uh, underutilized, uh, under uh, under uh, is it not like difficult to uh, to tell people they like, just like change your diet of what you were accustomed to something else? It takes time, yes. But then pe when people, when someone starts it and they, they see, they always they need to see a result, right? Mm -hmm. So if we start with a small village, there, there are people who, look, every, st every good thing doesn't come easy. You need to work for it, and you need to encourage people. But then when you start with a small community and then they start to see the result, people will always start to, to take it. It wasn't easy for them to adopt the, the exotic crop like veg uh, the carrot and stuff, but then they got into it. So then slowly, you can take them back to what they, they are used to. Are these yeah. crops completely unutilized today? And grown no, there long? are people growing. OK, so this is the interesting thing. My grandmother is a farmer. Okay. And she still grow a lot of these crops I talk about. So it's not completely, but just that people are not like, the majority <coughs> of people are not into it. Is it not a kind of, like a kind of a traditional food that people like to go, let's say, to go back to? As if uh, I mean, for you, remind you your grandmother's uh, garden. And yeah, they, I mean, the older generation are still eating it, like my grandmother. But like, there are still people in my age who grew up in the village and they are still in the village. They give birth to kids and they don't want to go back to it. So that's where the problem starts because then they are also those that are giving birth more to kids now, and then the kids become more malnourished. So even though their grandmothers and their mothers are still growing it, but they are not really interested. So then the family also are not encouraged to grow it more because if, if I grow it, I don't get anyone to eat it or purchase it, you know. So then they stop it and then it becomes redundant. I would like to make a comment about the choice of these crops as, as compared to, let's say, uh, 
modern, more frequently used uh, species or cultivars, okay? Now, these crops, these endogenous crops are uh, sometimes people call them like orphan crops because, because they are not grown in, in, the, uh, uh, in the developed countries and they did not, they are not such big crops that uh, I would say that uh, justify uh, attention and research That's effort true. from the big uh, breeding companies. Mm -hmm. And therefore these crops like, they like remained Let's Untapped. say at, at, as land races, as very old land races. Now, if you take these crops, in many cases, since they have gone through, I would say, natural selection in the hand of the farmers for hundreds or maybe thousands of years, they are capable of resisting all kinds of stresses. Whereas if you take, let's say, modern cultivars of whatever it is, they were bred and selected for maximum yield under optimal conditions. And these optimal conditions are not always available under such a, a, a backyard a, a gardens. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think the choice of in, endogenous crops is, is, is very correct because these crops are both adapted to the local conditions, but also they can, they are adapted to let's say low input agriculture with less fertilizer, less water, and also can resist many diseases, whether it be water, salinity, pests, diseases, etc. So, so I think the choice of these crops is, is, is correct. Yes, Fata. Uh, and how to encourage to the Well, the technique is already there. That's why I told you that typically I, I will use my grandmother. My grandmother still grows it. So there are still people who grow it. So we just need to, I mean, if there, there is a technique we need to, to teach them so that they'll get um, high yielding crops, yes, we will. But then when you go to such villages, you don't want to make, bring yourself like, and then it will be like, you know more than them. You have to be at the same level with them. So you start something, you tell them, okay, what you know, what will you do it? So there will be like a, a farm um, um, research. So they do how they know it. And then we also, we've learned, we know how we can do it. And then we compare wherever we have the high yielding and stuff. And then they'll start adopting it. I think that's what you need to work with the farmers, but not go there and then be like a teacher teaching them. You can also learn a lot from them. So. Yeah. Sayo, yeah, um, you said something about when they see results, maybe they will be encouraged to incorporate things or something. But I was just thinking um, for the Yura people, like sometimes the result is not obvious. Like you are talking about micronutrients, like you, maybe somebody is not sure, maybe I'm malnourished and I'm sitting down because maybe I'm becoming poor and you just think I'm okay. But I'm just thinking for the Yura people, do, do you think the results will be more obvious to them, for them to incorporate and to start, oh, this is changing, I should go into it? Like, how do you think the results, how do you think they can see it and they like it? And That's such a, a good question, seriously, but that's why I'm saying that, that's why we have nutritionists, like it's yeah. plant science and nutritionists. They go to hospitals, right? And then when they go to hospitals, they tell them that your child is sick or whatever. So if they start to eat and then they see that their, their kids are more healthy now, you know, because you measure the height of the kids and then the weight, and then the, the nurses or doctors can tell them your child is malnourished. Then let's say you start eating, you know, you start giving the child what the, the needed nutri uh, nutrient, like you, you give the, the corn, the banku, the fufu, and now you can really add more vegetables. 
And then within three months, the kid, they, they take uh, the kid back to the hospital and then they say, oh, the kid is putting on weight. She looks healthy. You don't think that they will know that it's also part of their health. It, it doesn't take a, it doesn't come easily. But I think there are certain things which is obvious because just imagine when a kid is malnourished, you have to always take the ch a child uh, to hospital. You have to always, and then for like three months, you start doing this and the child start playing around with friends. They will see it. There are certain things which, which can be really obvious. So, but yes, I mean, it's, it's not easy, but we are optimistic. Oh, Kumar, sorry. Uh, I see there are food diversification from. Uh, food diversification means uh, the gathering the different items of food, I mean, like vegetables uh, and other foods, or to diversify the same item of foods. For example, uh, for in my country, we have millet. There's also one indigenous crops, but people do not like to eat it. But nowadays, we prepare different item of that food, that millers, we call thukpa, for preparation of thukpa, then it's very, it has very good market, and also it's very nutritious, that's millers. So if you have this type of uh, diversification of the item of the crop, Ah, you mean the same crop, but then yeah, different types of it. Yeah, I showed you the garden eggs, and it's, we have like 29 different, it's not actually species, it's like uh, land races. So there are different types you can try. So yes, even within the... People hesitate to eat the consume the indigenous food, right? Because if we make that indigenous food of different items, for example, if we make cake from the millet, mm -hmm. then people will consume it. Mm -hmm. Because they, they think if some have hesitated to consume the other item of millet, they consume the cake. So did you practice this time? No, I didn't, but thank you. I would note it. It's a it's a good thing. So maybe the nutritionist among us can start, yeah. you know, suggesting that. So thank you. I we didn't think of it, but yes. Okay, I think I this will. Uh, I see that I cannot stop this discussion, <laughs> so I will let it go for two two more uh, two more comments, just short comments. Okay. Um, what I want to say is, most of the vegetables you, sh you showed us, the uh, Italian long and the amaranthos. These are weeds in the rural area. That's what they think. In, in, in the rural areas in Nigeria, they are weeds. And as the rural people are just like their name, they are rural. It's, it's very difficult to change their notion. It's right. true. So if you go to the, for example, we have a terminology we use exactly for the Talilon Triangularity issue. We say, what it means is that it grows everywhere you just you don't need to cultivate tiny long triangular to have tiny long triangular. So how how would you uh, because the first thing to me short comments yes, please yes, the first thing to me is that you have to try to change their mindset. How would you try to change their mindset? This rural mindset well I said it before I think uh, I said it before it's all going there and then working with them. You cannot just go there and then have it in mind, I'm going to change someone. You cannot change anyone. Change comes by ourselves. You need to tell yourself that I want to change. But then mostly people will also change by looking at you, what you are doing, and then they see the result, and then they adapt to it. So you cannot change the people, but then from the results you get, people will start to change by it. The That's what I is, believe. The point is, I think, to identifying like a leading figure in the village, a person that is, is uh, well uh, uh, honored by the village and if is uh, willing to accept the, this so-called innovation, because it's not, re I mean, it's innovation in a way because you're growing a, a, a home garden, but it's like going back to your traditional crops. But if he's going to ad adopt this, this kind of change, then after a year or two, people will say, hey, He's doing very mm -hmm. well. Why can't I do it also? Ainea, last comment, please, b very brief. I think you said what I wanted. I was just saying that it should be a multidisciplinary approach. You work with the nutritionists in the hospital, then it will be taken up here because they can advise the people that please take this approach. The way the child was saying. So it will be an easy approach, it will not be a hard approach. Thank you. Okay, Lydia, thank you very much for coming here.
Please remember, we have an appointment. 20 years from now. 20 years? Okay. Okay, I will put it... Uh, now, we, now on the computer you can make an appointment for 200 years, no problem. So I will put it there. And thank you for this uh, discussion, encouraging uh, lecture. Thank you very much. We shall continue now with our uh, student presentations. And uh, uh, the next presentation will be by, uh, sorry, by, by uh, Ainea Lucibia from Kenya, please. Okay, so my name is Ainea Obed from Kenya. I, I worked on a project under the supervision of Professor Djokovic at this university. And the uh, topic of my research is the uh, evaluation of the global environment, uh, uh, environmental abundance of Dolovibrio and like organisms, abbreviated as BALOS. I just want to tell you something about the topic so that we go together. Dolovibrio are gram-negative bacteria that predate, that, that, that are predators of other gram-negative bacteria. So if we have other bacteria that actually have a predation lifestyle on other bacteria, they are the ones we are calling like organisms. So as a way of introduction, uh, ballos are very small organisms. They are rod-shaped, they are highly motile uh, by use of polar flagella. They are obligate aerobes, gram-negative in the class of delta and alpha proteobacteria. These bacteria are obliga have obligate host dependency on a wide range of other gram-negative bacteria, which include several human, animal, and plant pathogens, for example, Escherichia coli, Pseudomonas, Rhizobium, and Salmonella. And they have been found to be ubiquitous in soil, plant roots, seawater, <coughs> fresh water, brackish water, sewage, mammalian intestines, and even irrigation water. Uh, Terrestrial uh, strains of these bacteria, and even the ones that are found in fresh water and seawater, have been found to associate with biofilms. These bacteria have what we call biphasic life cycle. That means two phases of the life cycle, which are divided uh, uh, as an attack phase and then the growth phase. During the attack phase, this bacteria is free swimming and it is not growing. Uh, and as it swims, it is looking for the prey. And then when it encounters the prey, it attacks the prey and attaches onto it reversibly. Uh, reversibly, I mean it can it, it is it is it takes some time to see if it is actually a prey that should be invaded. Then once it recognizes that the prey can be invaded, it, it will actually pierce into the prey and then enter into its body. Once it enters into its periplasm, it closes the entry. And then from inside, it will do actually what we call establishment. Once it establishes itself inside, it forms what we call a belloplast. And then this belloplast is actually osmotically stable in such a way that now when the bacteria is in, it's, it's inside, the only thing it's now doing is feeding and growing. Then from inside, we can see there is what we call filamentous growth inside the belloplast, and then the bacteria will actually go into septation where it will divide, and then inside there, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the bellovibrio that are formed will actually form the filament for growth and then after that, it will actually lias 
the, the yellow plant, and then after that, they will swim out. These ones are now in the attack phase. I talked of the growth phase, and the growth phase starts at this particular point when it starts feeding. So uh, once some of the things that we should learn from this cycle is that this bacteria has two phases. I talked of two phases. And then the attack phase and the growth phase. At the end of it all, we, we realize that the prey is liars. It's no more. It was attacked, and it is no more. And based on this, and I also talked initially about this bacteria being able to attack pathogens of animals, plants, and, uh, <coughs> and even humans. It is unable to invade the human cells. So that is something that has made it possible for so much of the research to be done into it to see if it is unable to invade human and animal and plant cells, yet it can be able to attack the pathogens that attack these uh, humans. Then it means it has some advantages that can be utilized in nature. So a lot of research has been done to see the uses of this bacteria in environment. And they have realized that it can be used in the control of biofilms because biofilms are hard to control. But then the bacteria are able to invade the, the, the biofilms, even where uh, uh, things like bacteriophages cannot do. They are able to invade these bac uh, uh, bi bi biofilms and penetrate them and even destroy them. They have also been, uh, sh they have shown that they can also be used in water recycling. <coughs> and they have been shown that they, they are able to control pathogenic and food spoilage organisms. They can be used against multidrug resistance, which means they have some therapeutic uh, values also. So in short, I mean the bacteria have been found to be like an all-round organism that can be utilized. And even some research papers say that these bacteria have been found uh, like the way I was saying that they are unable to invade the, 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 the human and animal cells. They have been found that when they have been utilized, for example, in animal health, they actually reduce the pathogens in the gut, but then the effect, the side effects on the animals have not been seen. So the well-being of the animal is ensured. And despite the aspect that these bacteria have been seen to be utilized in the environment, also having uh, effect on bacterial ecology, very little has been done on the ecology of these bacteria in terms of their environment to see what really affects them. So based on that, uh, our research was actually to see which environments do these bacteria come from and to determine their, to their, their, their abundance in these environments and to see if the environmental factors in these environments are correlated to the bacterial abundance. So how did we do this? There is a, a website called MGRAST, which has uh, the metagenomes of this bacteria. So actually, we went into this MGRAST. We wanted to extract uh, the sequences from projects that used 16S ribosomal DNA as a primer. But we didn't track it just like that. We actually went, we extracted the amplicon sequences, amplicon type sequences. Then after that, we actually went for only the general, where the general primer was used. Because as I said, we are actually targeting not just Del Vibrio, but Del Vibrio and like organisms. So we went for general because it gives more information on not only on the target. And then at the end of it all, we actually identified 45 projects and 1,442 genera of bacteria and 27, 26, as in 2,726 samples that we analyzed in this project. Only the ones that were, uh, the, the, the general primer was used. And after that, we loaded this back to the, 
to the MGRAST server for analysis. And in this analysis, we chose RDP annotations. The ri ri ribosomal database project was used. And we wanted to compare our sequences to the sequences in the RDP in such a way that we wanted uh, to have a, a certain E value. And uh, also, we also wanted actually just the, 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 the sequence, our sequences to be identical. We, we gave it a minimum of 60%. And then we generated the heat map for visualization of our data. After generation of the, of, of, of the heat map, we regrouped it as to the genus. Maybe here I'll also talk about something on the genus because some of these bacteria that I've said uh, that are like organisms to Delvibdo, the, the, the species that acts as a predator has not been recognized, but we see that in the genera, they can identify that, okay, this genera has some predation aspects. So our study was just on genus level. And then we actually drew our values of the heat map and generated our data now in Excel spreadsheets. Now this data, we actually, this is raw data, and then we use this raw data now to see out of this raw data, after getting the, uh, the 1,442 genera, how many of these genera are predators, and we only identified from those samples that we could have only the 13 that I'm going to talk about. So that is the total project. And when we, after this, we loaded this into PCOD for analysis now. So in our data analysis, we had several of the results that we got from PCOD. Uh, we actually did multi-response permutations procedures. And by this, we were able to compare communities of different bacteria by pairwise comparisons uh, at 95% confidence interval. I mean, uh, at a P of equal to or less than 0 0.05. And also, we did ordination analysis, which was actually to give us if uh, the, the correlation between this bacterial community, individual bacterial community, and the, the, the total bacterial community of the predators to the environmental factors that actually we have. And that one we are using actually a, a either a regression or we use a value called tau, which I'll show you in a while, but the minimum of 0 0.3. And then uh, <coughs> this, this data is uh, is actually, it, we don't have the, 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 the statistical aspect of this, but it is just a visual kind of thing, but it is backed by MRPP, which gives a statistical value. And MDS, which is non-metric multidimensional scaling, which actually was just to compare these communities based on, on, on counts or phylo phylogenetic distance. So on my results and discussion, we got some clustering reports. And clustering was to give us where the bacteria was found. You remember one of my objectives was to see where these predators are found. And clustering gave us that, uh, I'll just give not all the, the genus because they are 13 and the time might not allow. But we actually found that the Delvibrio genus could be found in soils, in human gut, in fresh water, in sewage, but as I said, also the abundances were also seen from this graph, the clustering results, as I'll show you in a while. We also got that uh, bacterial borax could be found in soils, sewage, and seawater. Peridibacter was found in soils, human gut, biofilms, and sewage. And cytophaga was found in soils, seawater, and animal gut. Now, 
maybe uh, just a clarification is that I told you that we we generalized, we, we got for the all the projects because we did 45 projects. So out of these 45 projects, we actually got 13 genera of the predators. So we were analyzing in PCO for all the 13 predators and we wanted to see the effects of environments on individual and also on the total community. So when I'll be talking about total community here, I mean actually the percentage of the predators that were present in that project. Not the total bacterial community, but the percentage of predators. So, and I did the general analysis and actually took each of the projects to see what are these effects now on individual projects. Now, this is one of the examples of the projects that I took. It is a Lauber project. And this is a clustering result. And you can see that these ones, these ones are samples of this project. And then up there, we have the species that we identify, those are 13. And from here, we can see that in this box, we can see where each species is found. And we can see that the darker it is, the more abundant it is. But then in this project, we realize that we have actually all the 13 species were found in soil. And now, I didn't only talk about this, but I talked about uh, a few projects. And I took also MTR where biofilm was used as a sample. And we also, we also found all the 13 species there. And another uh, one on ocean where we actually found that Cytophaga was actually the most abundant. <coughs> and this is one of the results of <coughs> NMDS, and as you realize, at this particular point is that most of these species are clustered here. It shows that they are not significantly different. They are more similar in terms of, I'm talking about the community structure, in terms of diversity and composition. Because if they actually, uh, uh, one of the, of the diagrams showing a community is clustering, it shows that actually it is actually is overlapping on another one. They are not actually significantly different. But that one, I say that it is backed with MRPP, which shows actually the values at which they are. This one is just a scale. These are different features from different environment. By features, I mean maybe we collected samples of soil. We collected samples of, of seawater. Those are the features that we collected. And uh, that is it. And this one is actually MRPP statistics from lower soils. And we will actually just look at this at the p-value. I say that if it is 0 0.05 or less, there, there is significant differences among the communities. And this is what we found, that they were not significantly different. And now, because you can see the values are, zero, uh, are above 0 0.05, and now, what do we know? What do we learn about from this? And from this, that from literature, it has been shown that uh, soils with similar environmental characteristics have similar bacterial communities, regardless of, ge of the geographic distance. I have talked about this when I was showing uh, the, the MRPP. Uh, and then now, this is ordination results uh, from all the projects <coughs> that I analyzed individually. And we can only check at the tau value that I was telling you, 0 0.03. Uh, 0 0.3 is the minimum value. And at this point, we see that actually the pH, the community structure, uh, the, 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 the predators abundance, individual predator abundance was not affected by the pH. Was, or not, was not correlated by the pH. But the pH actually, which means that the pH had actually an influence on the total bacterial averages, not bacterial average, but, but the predator averages uh, in the soil project. And then uh, also the sewage, in sewage, where uh, sewage was actually collected to check the bacterial communities, we actually found that there was negative correlation with the latitude. 
and even in saline water. Now, what does this show, uh, show us? Actually, I, I, I learned that actually if the predators are not affected by the environment, then there could be something else affecting them. And from this, uh, because it's a mixture of predators, some of them are obligate and others are, uh, are facultative. Then the obligate ones, if we are checking on individual basis, the obligate ones will be affected by the prey and not the environmental uh, parameters like pH. But if actually uh, we have the facultative ones and they are the, the most stubborn and because they depend on other factors apart from the, the prey, they can, they can even feed on uh, the dead material, isn't it? Then, so even in that case, and they, 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 are, they are the most abundant. Then, if we are checking at the total community and the factor affects them, then we will actually rea uh, think that the factor is affecting the bacteria. And that is why we see that this factor could be affecting the total bacterial community and not individual bacteria. So, if we talk about soils, it was shown in literature that soil pH is a key determinant of diversity and composition of bacterial community by Ferrer and Jackson, which is in line with our literature, with our findings. And also it was shown that the various edaphic factors and agricultural land use affect the bacterial community, which means that all those factors, that the, the only factor that was measured that we found in this was pH, it is not the only factor that affects the bacterial community. So there was need for more to be measured in this particular community. And in marine also literature says that bacteriovorax are really affected, they really depend on biofilms for survival. And <coughs> that really shows that there is need for them, especially at, at stress uh, environments, they actually need uh, this to, uh, to, to survive. So in soil, it was found that the vibrio was found in soil, in most soils, in human gut. And this one is in line with David and Jukovic, who actually found that actually that the vibrio strains were found in soil, in roots, and fresh water and not in marine. Cytophaga was actually abundant in, in marine, and this one also is in line with Lobel in 1998. And from this, we can actually say that Cytophaga might be a common member of my microbial community. So in conclusion, I would say that a lot of environmental factors have been found to dictate bacterial community. And cluster uh, analysis has shown that actually there was varying abundances in these different projects. But actually, the factors that were measured were very less. And they actually, we actually have realized that they didn't co show any correlation, which means there are other factors that we actually needed to have to see this. So in, in terms of studying these bacteria and understanding them very well, we need actually to measure all the factors. So thank you. <coughs> thank you, Ainea. We'll take questions now. Yes. Daniel, please. Are the bellows um, how specific? Bacteria. They actually prey on other uh, gram negative bacteria, but uh, the others that have not been realized, they, they, they could not be so specific because I, I say that we have obligate and others are saprophytic, so it's not really specific. Yeah. Yes? Yes. No, uh, sorry. First, you read about first. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so they tried those uh, pre in balance. Mm. Are they pre for pathogenic bacteria or uh, beneficial bacteria? They are maybe for pathogenic. Can they be available in the laboratory and can be used for the benefit of improvement of agriculture? 
Yes. Yes. For which one? Yeah, like for example, I saw, I showed that actually uh, 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 some of them, if you ask about if they are predatory to beneficial bacteria, they are, uh, there is some literature that say that, for example, in agriculture, that some of them were used uh, just to see if, uh, okay, you, you ask if they can be reared in, in, in the laboratory or. I can give an example of the therapeutic aspect, which I say that some of them can be used direct, or in, in, they can be used actually, uh, they can be reared and utilized. And that is for therapeutic aspect. And uh, even in agriculture, I talked of them actually preying against other pathogens. Yeah. So it is for pathogenic aspects, but it was found that actually from literature that they have little effect on other important uh, aspects that might benefit the environment. Yeah. So mostly it's pathogenic. Yes, No, I didn't say that. I said that when it attacks, it will form actually a abdeloblast. And this abdeloblast is actually, when it, is, it attacks, it enters the, the periplasm of the prey. So when it is inside, it is actually developing from the nutrients of the prey. So it is not now lacing itself. It is lacing the 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 the, the, wall, the, the prey the, the prey cell uh, cell wall. So maybe if I show you the. So, yeah. so uh, maybe you did a nice screen, general screen of the, in the presence of uh, ballots in several environments. Yeah. So, uh, what what would you do next? What what do you suggest to, to, to next to have all these data now from mm -hmm. the ballots from many environments? <coughs> to which place would you take? This project next. Uh, the major aim of this was to see, actually, to understand the bio processes because we have seen that they, they, they have a lot of uses in nature. So when we understand the bio processes, then uh, it can uh, contribute to literature on their utilization. We actually know what factors promote their, 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 their abundance. And in terms of utilization, then we can know how to extract and utilize them. But if yeah, you right. would say, ah, sorry, but there is some some findings, some major findings from your work that you maybe can give you some idea to take this one, one step forward to, to say, wow. Yeah. Something surprising in your results, something uh, that you didn't expect and, uh, and, uh, and I will uh, more attention. I will not say surprising, but I will say major findings. Uh, major findings were this, uh, as I concluded, is that uh, because we were depending on the, uh, on, the, on the projects that have been analyzed and have been sampled in the field, and we realized that we were depending on the measurements they were making, I would say that actually we had uh, an obstacle of getting most of the information because some projects were, were not measuring these parameters that could really be uh, affecting this bacteria. But if we had those aspects, actually, it could be a major uh, move. <coughs> And uh, we could have gotten a lot of information to contribute to literature so much. We have a couple of questions here by your mentor, mm -hmm. Edward Yurkevich. Yeah. You will be glad to hear that he was watching you through the web. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, w first question, why do you think that yeah. different bacteria, including balos, yeah. should inhibit different bacteria? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, okay, because some other bacteria have, uh, have uh, negative impacts uh, in environment, then if these bacteria can be used, as I said, that they are used against other pathogens, for example, the ones in plants, and I named examples, then if these bacteria can be utilized, then it is an advantage for us. So if they inhibit these bacteria and destroy them the way I've shown on the life cycle, then I think it's an advantage. We will have gotten an advantage. The question, as I understand it, is that mm. why do you think that different bacteria, including balos, yeah. should inhibit different bacteria? If I understand it correctly, mm. so you will uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong, if I understand it correctly, he would mean here why a certain bacteria <coughs> would be specific to certain species of other bacteria to uh, uh, feed on it. Why are they specific, those uh, ballos? Why are they specific to certain uh, uh, races or types of bacteria? I think that is preference. Preference? Yeah. Based preference on, on what? Uh, on mind, the, yeah. what? Which factors maybe you know that mm. are involved in the determination of this uh, specificity? If, if there is knowledge about it. No. Not a good one. Okay. Another question. Mm. Are bacteria limited in dispersion to the, sa uh, the same way as animals and plants are? No, I don't think that is, a, that is the case because as I gave, like, for example, the life cycle of this bacteria, I don't think they are limited. Based on the environment that they have, given that they are in air, they are in seaweed, they are, and the movement of of air also enables them actually to freely survive and move. I, I think it is, a, and even water. So I don't think they are limited in dispersion because environment also promotes their movement. Okay, we have time for one last question, please. Someone else? No? Okay, so you'll get your second question. In your methodology, you mentioned like you use general primers yeah. and then specific primers. No, I didn't use specific primers, I used you general primers. You used primers for yeah. each uh, and you wanted to look at the broad yeah. uh, spectrum and you use the primers. Yeah. So, can you explain what you mean by it? In, in primers, they have to, to add ingredients, they have to be specific. No, I didn't use, uh, in this project, this is not a lab-based project. What I said, we were actually analyzing data that was already available. It's so we wanted... Purely uh, bioinformatic yeah. Uh, project. Yeah, so we, we were using, uh, we, uh, we were looking for the projects where they used not specific primers, not specific 16 uh, <coughs> S-ribosomal DNA, but general. That's what I said. As you know, so, one of the, I would say, the innovations of this era is that not always you have to go to the lab to get data. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can just go to databases compute through the computer and start <coughs> collecting data and make use of huge amounts of data that are available there. Take data from different sources, do comparisons and, and just yes. extract a lot of knowledge out of the data that is already available. Okay, Aidea, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so we shall move on to our next speaker, uh, Salam Babajid from Nigeria. <laughs> thank you, Shuki. My name is Salam Bolaji from Nigeria. The title of my research work is Identification of Genes Involved in Tutri Motility in Acidobura Citruli by Generation and Characterization of a Library of Transposome Mutants. This research was, was, con was conducted under the supervision of Professor Saul Bodman from the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology. As a form of introduction, Acidobura Citruli is a gram negative biotrophic bacterium. It causes seedling blight and bacterial fruit blood of cucubit. As you can see in the picture, the, uh, the disease symptoms start with water soaking regions and aggravate into necrotic spots, then the eventual death of the seedling. More also in the fruit, you can see the water soaking spot also with roundish halos around it before the deterioration of the fruit condition. BFB is a threatening disease of cucubits. It may cause total crop loss under warm and humid conditions. Since the outbreak in Marina Islands and in Florida in the 80s, the, bacteria, the bacterium has gained wild importance because of the spread all over the world. However, reliable management practice is still far-fetched and limited. Although copper-based bactericides have been used but have proven of limited efficacy. As, as, well as it truly is 
adds two genetically distinct groups. Group one includes strains which are associated mainly from non-watermelon host, while the group two includes strains that were associated with the watermelon host. As it overall, it really depends on functional type 3 secretion system for pathogenicity and a percentage response in non-host plants. This means that a mutation in the type 3 secretion system leads to inability of this pathogen to cause disease or to even cause HR, which is a percentage response in, in non-host plants. The pathogen contains a single polar flagellum. The flagellum is essential for swimming motility. This is the flagellum. The type 4 pillar are air like appendages found on the surface of the wide range of bacteria. This is the type 4 pillar, as you can see in the picture. They constitute an efficient device for a particular type of flagellum independent surface motility, which is called twitching motility. Twitching motility is just the retraction and the protrusion of the pillars. So, as you can see here from this picture, this blue, this blue spot has changed location with time due to the retraction and the protrusion of the pillars. These air like appendages are involved in multiple functions and are part, from, are part of the virulence determinant of the pathogenicity of the pathogen. Other functions of the type of filler include biofilm formation, adhesion, colonization, and uptake of genetic material. What do we mean by uptake of genetic material? It means horizontal gene transfer, and some articles refer to it as the ba bacterium competence. A mutagenesis based study in our, in our laboratory has demonstrated the role of type of filler and twitching motility for full virulence of the pathogen. This brings us to the objective of this research. The major objective of this work was to enlarge our knowledge of the ac genes that are associated with twitching motility and to assess their respective role in the virulence of the pathogen. For the methodology, we made use of two type 4 mu pillar mutants, which is the M6M and the M6T. The M6M is impaired in the PM. The PM is essential for the assembly of pillars protein. And we also make use of the M60, which is essential, which is, uh, which is impaired in the PUT. The PUT is essential for the, for the retraction of the pillars. So as a result of inability for the pillars to be retracted, it leads to hyperpilation of these mutants. We also make use of the E. coli BW25141, and also plasmids that we use include POC4K and p -mode plasmids. For the experiment proper, we carry out what is called the random mutagenesis approach. Canamycin gene was excited from POC4 with an enzyme called BAMH1 and was subsequently cloned to the multiple cloning sites of the vector, which is called the P-mode vector. Subsequently, we used one microliters of the transposome and we mix it up with the 60 microliters of M6 electrocompetent cells and electroporated it at a time constant, and we got a time constant of five, and only the non twitching mutant were selected. In order to identify the mutated, mutated genes, we had to carry out a procedure which is called the rescue clone procedure. To carry out the rescue clone procedure, we did DNA extraction using the DNA extraction kit, and subsequently, we, did, we used restriction enzymes. For example, we used the SAC1 and the P to do the cutting, the restriction. However, during the restriction, the, 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 the transposome was kept intact, keeping the canamycin and the origin of replication intact. But however, the genomic DNA was cut. We also did ligation of the restriction <coughs> product with the T4 ligase enzyme. Subsequently, the autoligated products were electropro electro electroporated into E. coli cells. And these products were plated on LB with canamycin, and the, the, the plasmid were purified, and the plasmid was sent for sequencing. For the sequencing, the plasmid was sent to iLab for the sequencing of the flanking regions surrounding the insertion site of the mutagenesis cassette using the P-mode primers. In order to assess the virulence of the pathogen, we carried out what was called seed transmission assays. Fresh cultures of mutants and M6 were prepared Cultures were suspended on sterile water and adjusted to 10 respiral six of colony forming units per mill. 10 melon seeds were placed into the bacterium suspension in vacuum tubes and placed on the shaker for two hours. Subsequently, we dried these seeds in laminar fluid, in the laminar wood for two hours, and subsequently we sold them on soil mix in the greenhouse at a temperature of about 25 to 28 degrees Celsius for 10 days. We took measurements of the stain length and the foliage weight 10 days after inoculation, we also tried to look at the symptoms of emerging seedlings visually. It was it were evaluated visually five days after inoculation. Based on the results we received from iLabs, 
we, and subsequent to blasting, we did what was called swimming motility RC for one of the mutants. To carry out the swimming motility RC, we did a fresh culture of bacteria. It was grown overnight. We incubated it and also took two microliters of this sample and stabbed it into 0.3% nutrient agar. Subsequently, we, we incubated this for 48 hours. And after 48 hours, we measured the length of the ELOs and took photographs of the ELOs. For our results, two libraries of transposome mutants were generated from the experiments. We generated 356 mutants from both libraries, out of which 32 mutants did not show any sign of twitching motility when viewed or assessed with the naked eyes. It's truly M6 mutants showed no twitching motility. As you can see here on this, ag on this agar plate, you can see twitching motility. This is the wire type, which is called the M6. You can see the twitching arrows around the wire type. However, for the, for the library two and for the library one, these are mutants we were, which were impaired in the ability for twitching motility. Based on the results we, we got from iLabs, we subject the, the, the sequence we got from iLabs to, we, to blasting against the genome sequence of AAC001 in order to get the, the exact gene. And these are the genes that we identified. We got the putative transparent protein, transparent membrane protein, which is called the FIMV. We also identified GSPPD. We identified sigma 54, GA, ATPA subunit, flagella basal rock, flag C protein, and PW, etc. Now, this is the pictorial view of the blast we did. We tried to identify the position of the gene in the genome. And identify the position of FIMG, we tried to look at other genes that the neighboring engine genes surrounding it. And doing this, we realized that none of the genes surrounding the FIMV are also involved in twitching motility. Also, we did a protein blast in order to see the position of the FIMV in the domains. And we identified that the FIMV is located in the FIMV core. Also, we did a blast for the Flixi. The, Flixi we ident the protein blast for the Flixi, we identified that the Flixi is also located in domains which also contains the Flix B, the Flix F, and the Flix B, B rod. The blast we did for GA showed uh, a, uh, a difference in the sense that the neighboring gene of GA is called the methyl acetylene chemotaxis sensory transducer. So we, and we understand that this gene is also responsible, is also involved in chemotaxis. So we tried to look at the number of base pairs between this gene and this gene. And we found that the number of base pairs between this gene is very low. So we, 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 we suspected that it is possible that these two genes are of the same operon. Based on the, the last slide I showed you about swimming motility assay conducted, it was because of the Flixi mutants. We carried out swimming motility assay because of the Flixi mutants. We compared it to the Y type, and we could see here a significant difference between the Flixi mutant, which is the L120, and the Y type. This picture shows the, the, spreading of the, the, the spreading of the M6, that's the usage of the flagellum, for traveling. In the, and it, it shows a significant higher diameter covered. However, the L1, L120, which is the Flixi, Flixi mutant, showed, remained on a single spot. Also, the PT mutant was remained on a single spot. As I told you earlier, when I told you PT mutants, are impaired in the PUT gene, and the PUT gene is essential for retraction of the pillars. However, because the, the, there was no retraction in, in, the, in the PUT mutant, this it results to hyperpilation, and this hyperpilation led it impedes the easy movement of the flagellum. Thus, these mutants remained stagnant and could not swim. Type 4 mutants showed reduced percentage of dead seedlings. From our experiment, we saw that higher percentage of, percentage of dead seedlings were recorded with MC mutants as compared to other mutants. We also took stem, stem length measurement, and we saw a significant difference between the M6 and the mutants, and also the control. We saw that the M6 has lower, lower length stem length. Also, we, saw, uh, we, measured the folio, we took measurement of the folio grid, and we also saw a significant difference between the M6 and the mutants also with the control. We did measurement of the disease severity score 10 days after inoculation, and we found out that the M6 has higher rate of disease severity score as compared to the mutants. This is a picture just showing you uh, the, the symptoms. This is, a symptom, this is a picture showing you the symptoms 10 days after inoculation, and you can see vividly. This is the M6. It is highly uh, highly det detrimental on the seedlings, and you can see the percentage of death. You can see that most of the seedlings are dead. However, for the mutants. Though they show mild symptoms, but they were still very much alive. In the present study, 
we have identified and characterized new genes associated with twitching motility and assessed their role in the virulence of the pathogen. The importance of type 4 pili for twitching motility and the virulence and virulence was exhibited by all our mutants as reported in various works with mutation in similar genes. For example, the putative transparent protein is essential for virulence and twitching motility as seen in the experiment on agar plate and seed transmission assay. Similar result was reported by Samla et al. in 2000. He reported that a mutation in Finvin gene, which was, which was a novel gene in, Pseudomon in, in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that a mutation or a destruction of this gene leads to inability <coughs> for the mutant to twitch on, 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 on the agar plate and also a reduction in virulence in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. From this report, it was shown that the loss of PW gene in, in Acidura citrulli resulted in a loss of twitching motility and type 4 related functions. The gene is reportedly needed for pillow stabilization. Pillow stabilization. Similar results was, was, uh, was reported by Carbonell and Elin in 2005. They reported that a mutation in the PW gene in Neseria gonorrhea leads to a formation of a non pileated mutant and also a reduction in virulence of the mutant. In this present study, we found out that polar flagellum mutants are affecting the virulence and showed utter twitching motility in Acidovora citrulli. This was demonstrated also in our laboratory by Bayer et al. 2009 and 2011. It demonstrated that, that a mutation in the flick C mutant and the flea R mutant showed that the, the, the flea the, the and the flea swim mutants were impaired in the, in the flagellar, flagellar gene that is required for swimming motility and virulence also, and also twitching motility, twitch, motility. So these mutants, however, displayed a reduction in virulence, displayed lack of swimming ability, and also displayed an abolished twitching mot motility. An interesting gene that captivated attention was the sigma, sigma 54, which is called the Ripon. This protein was suggested to be involved in transcription of nitrogen fixation genes, flagellins, and pilins. Our report suggests its involvement in twitching motility and virulence of Acidovora citrulli. Similar report was reported by Pakal et al. 2006. They reported that sigma, sigma 54 is essential for the promoter region, which is essential for the transcription of FIM-A. And we understand that most of the FIM genes are involved in type 4 pili formation. Also, Patricia Eta reported similar reports. In 2003, she reported that uh, a mutation in sigma 54 component or factors leads to uh, a reduction in virulence of the pathogen. Our report suggests the involvement of Qa transduction histidine kinase in twitching motility and virulence of Acidovora citrulli. Similar report was also reported by Witch Touch et al. in 2004. They reported that Chip A is an homologous of chip A, and we know that chip A is, required, is, a, is a gene component required for twitching motility, and also that chip A, uh, loss of, of chip A gene is, 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 uh, brings, leads to a reduction in virulence of the pathogen when it was tested on, on Pseudomonas aeruginosa on mouse. In conclusion, the various experiments have shown the involvement of different genes in twitching motility and also their involvement for Acidovora citrullis gene virulence. For the future plans of our research work, we, we plan on identifying and characterizing more genes involved in twitching motility in Acidovora citrulli and assess their respective role in the virulence of the bacterium. Also, we plan to, to, take, to carry out biofilm assays for all our mutants in order to see the cell-to-cell -cell aggregation. Also, we intend to carry out chemotactic assays and swim motility assays in order to further characterize the GA mutants. We intend also to view mutants with newly identified genes on transmission electron microscope to examine the defects and or the, to, to see the state of the pili. Also, we intend to carry out southern blood to check if the canamycin cassette is not inserted into more than one spot in the genomic DNA of the pathogen or of the mutants. My acknowledgement goes to my mentor, Professor Sawu, for his love, for his passion, and for the way he saw me through all the entire research. He was like a father to me all throughout the entire research. And also to Tali, my colleague, and Norm, who were highly supportive, who put me through, through the entire research. And also to all the members of our laboratory. She Elohim, Yevaram, et Kolem. Thank you. What was the last sentence? What was the last sentence? <laughs>
I don't know. Is it a prayer? I don't know. Shit. I don't know. שאלוהים יברך את כולם, את כולכם. אוקיי. Thank you. Yes, רג'יט. Okay. Okay, you said uh, apart from the type 4 pillar, like I mentioned in the, in the second slide, I said type 4 pillar <coughs> depends basically, uh, uh, type 4 pillar is associated with treating motility. Acidovorous, as I said before, it's, uh, for the virulence of this pathogen, it requires a plethora of genes. Among these genes are involved, are, are found in the type 3 secretion system. And for the type 3 secretion system, we understand that the type 3 secretion system are encoded by what we call the HRP genes. For the HRP genes, they are located in what we call the pathogenicity islands. These HRP genes, uh, I I'm going to explain this, the, 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 the schematics of this type 3 secretion system based on the reports uh, of, uh, of Botner and Bonas, 2002, in Sandomonas uh, Campresis Patova Vesicatoria. What they, what they explained was that they said um, there's a HRP cluster which you have the HRP gene. The HRP gene activates the HRPX. The HRPX then activates other genes like the HRPC, HRPD, HRPE, which leads to the formation of effectors. These effectors now are channeled through HRP pillars. And these HRP pillars are also formed from the HRP genes. So the effectors are channeled through the HRP pillars, and it moves through the HRP pillars directly into the cytosol of the plant, which is going to affect. So what they did, they did a mutation in the HRPF. There's a, there's a pore which is called, the, which leads directly into the cytosol of the of the of the, of the plant. There's a, which is called the HRPF. They mutated this HRPF to see whether truly there's a pillars moving into the cytosol of the plant. So a mutation of the HRPF resulted that they noticed that the the effectors were shedding off into the environment and not directly into the cytosol of the plant. So they identify that if this HRP, that, like I told you before, a mutation in the HRP genes leads to uh, a reduction, uh, inability of the pathogen to form a disease, and inability of the pathogen to, to form HR. So a mutation in HRPF would, of, of course, obviously would lead to a with inability of the pathogen to form, to, to cause disease, and also to cause HR. So the type 3 secretion system, that's just the pathway for the type 3 secretion system. And also, once the effectors are released into the cytosol, the, every, every, the, the resistant gene in the plant, probably it might be constitutively expressed. If it's constitutively expressed, the resistant genes will try to always, the resistant gene pro protects the third component, which you understand to be the pathogenicity target. These pathogenicity targets are... Let's try to be short. Okay, so. Okay. The next Let's, question was. Uh, please, uh, question, please keep, uh, try to keep your questions short and your answers short as well. Okay. Uh, Javiera? Yes? Yeah, just have a question. Do I have a question? Yeah. What is the difference between twitching <coughs> and screening and how you differentiate this type of movement in the avatar? Okay, very good. Uh, let me show you a picture so you could just, it, it, it will explain better to you. One picture, picture is better than thousand words, words as yeah, we say. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So oh, oh you can't see oh, it's not uh, yeah, make the will, light work. I will make it for Yeah. You, you could see the there's uh, there are regions here like this is a soft agar. For you to examine to do a swimming motif, to check if a uh, bacteria is actually swimming, you need to do use a soft agar, 0.3% nutrient agar. So you could easily see after 48 hours the swimming abilities of a flagellated bacterium. You understand? It's going to swim on the plate. However, if it's, going to, if it's a mutant of flagellum, it's not going to swim. It's just going to remain stuck on the plate. But for twitching motility, <coughs> let me take you back to the next picture for swimming for twitching motility. Yeah, look at this. This is twi twitching motility. Formation of halos. You can see some halos around it. This is twitching motility. It is different from swimming. Swimming is going to spread on the plate. But for twitching, you can see it may stop, but however, it's showing some halos around the colonies. But in the bacteria itself, how, is it, how the bacteria make, make the difference in movement? 
They did okay for twitching for twitching motility. Basically, the bacteria use uh, the pillars like I told you: retraction, p extra uh, pr protrusion, retraction, protrusion, and it changes location. It changes the time. That, then for swimming, of course, flagella. It uses the flagella. Keep swimming around the plates. That's it. And my. Yeah, like uh, bowel film, of course, we know that it's just the, the aggregation on the EPS. We know the EPS is the extracellular protein substance that uh, have been secreted by the by bacterium in, uh, in, uh, in their, where they form aggregates. So this bowel film, it was reported by uh, Kang et al. 2002 that bowel film could uh, the, the obstruct the antimicrobials which are sent to the, which, which are released by the plant it, to, to, to fight against the bacterium. So biofilms protects, they protects the bacterium from the, from the antimicrobial substances which are released by the plant. Also reports also suggested from Zylella, Zylella fastidiosa that this biofilm could also block the xylem sap from, that's the, yeah. Shaul, please. Yes. So, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You get 30, 32, 32. 32 yeah. Some of them you sequence. Yeah, yeah. I sequenced. I sequenced ten of them. So, so, so it's a, so it means that about ten percent of of the mutants that you screen yeah had altered the altered switching motility. Yes, yes, so what yes, do you yes. Think it, this is uh, represents the the percentage of genes that are associated with switching in the bacteria, or you were just uh, lucky. In your that okay? The, no, like uh, no, no. Lucky is, is it's okay to be lucky. It's, it's uh, okay. To be yeah, lucky. yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. No, I, I, I would say something. Now, because we carried out the luck comes because we carried out what is called random mutagenesis. <coughs> random mutagenesis. You don't know where it, where the cannabis, where the cassette is going to fit into the genomic DNA. You don't know. So that is where the luck comes from. However, also because we understand that there are so many genes that are related to twitching motility. So if you, we don't know the number of genes that are related to twitching motility, so it comes to uh, uh, if you are lucky enough, you, under, you get more genes that are, that are in the genomic DNA of the bacterium. That's it. One last question, please. Who did not ask today? Bosaj. <coughs> uh, <Pusaj. coughs> um, I want to ask that how did you uh, confirm that you used uh, 10 responses? Um, OK, yeah, yeah. For the. That's for the scene transmission assays we conducted in the lab. For the scene transmission assays, we used 10 raised to power 6 of colony forming units per meal. Why did we use this? Uh, after we used it, you just want the confirmation. You need to carry out what is called serial dilution. I know most people don't do this because they rely on the result from the spec. After adjustment in the spec, they just do the adjustment and get 10 raised to power 6. They are fine with it. But I, because based in our lab, this is what we do. It's a protocol. You need to always confirm that you actually use the 10 raised power 6 of it. So we did a serial dilution. What you do in the serial dilution, you just get uh, 900 uh, microliters of the distilled water, mix it up with the 100. She will read the paper for the okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So then you plate it and you, you, get your, you do your calculation on Excel, you get the uh, 10 raised power 6. Yeah. <coughs> Diriba, last one. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twitching yeah. motility, twitching motility, and also as the yeah. And they have future uh, work to study other genes. Yes, more genes that yeah. are. Do you think how we can implement this knowledge for the pathogenicity to identify? Yeah, the okay. For the prevention of the disease that can be caused by this uh, bacteria. If I understand you carefully, what you're asking is. Uh, how this knowledge can be applied. Yeah. Very good. The thing is, the major challenge we have with Acidovorax it truly is that this pathogen, this pathogen, the, the thing is, we don't have enough knowledge of this pathogen. It is still very much lacking, and it's a major challenge. That is the, that is the focus point of our laboratory. We don't understand the plant's pathogen interaction. It's lacking all over the world. So this pathogen is using it as a yardstick. So, but however, by doing this, 
mutations, understanding the mechanism in plants, putting it in the plants, doing seed transmission assays, stem inoculations. You can see the interaction of plants. Are we going to now, mutate the bacteria in the atmosphere? Or? You can't mutate outside. Do you want us to go to jail? <laughs> you can't. How you can't can do it? You can't mutate outside. <laughs> However, even this mutation, <coughs> it is only reduction in virulence. The, pathogen, the pathogenicity of this pathogen is still retained. It's still pathogenic. You understand? It's still pathogenic. You understand the river? So, however, mutation in type 3 secretion system, mutation in type 3 secretion, if you mutate the type 3 secretion system, the pathogen lost its virulence, lost everything. So, if we can use the type 3 secretion mutants in the atmosphere, fine. If we can use it, if, if we are allowed to use it for a bio agent, good. Because we even had reports that some people in China are trying to use the type 3 secretion system mutant for bio agent against acidovorax. But research is still going on. So, that's just the. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> we will uh, go, we will take a short coffee break now for 15 minutes. In 15 minutes, we're all back here. Okay? <laughs> thank you. <laughs>